But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. May God bless the preaching of his word. Well, one of the joys of being a pastor is having a front row seat to see the work of God in his people. It is a joy day in, day out, week in, a week out to see him working in your lives and in our midst and in our community through his people. One of the questions that I love getting that I got uh, again, recently, and get, get this a number, you know, regularly, is how can I grow in my faith? How can I make progress in my walk with God? How can I know Jesus better? How can I see God's glory more? And I love these questions because these questions come from, from people who already evidently love the Lord. These questions come from people who embrace humility to the point that they're eager to ask outside counsel on how to grow in their faith. This question comes from a heart that knows it hasn't achieved the fullness of faith yet, and so they're eager to grow. God desires that we all, as His children, grow in our faith. He doesn't want us to continue on in immaturity, but He wants us to grow on to full maturity in our faith, and He has provided numerous means toward this end. He has given us His holy word, which is His revelation to us, He's spoken to us, and He has given us direction. He's given us this precious community of the people of God, a community of believers to belong to and to to strive together in our faith with. He has given us the spiritual disciplines. He has given us His Holy Spirit inside of us to grow us and conform us to His image. God doesn't desire something from us that He doesn't provide the means for. God has designed it so that you and I would make progress in the gospel. We would make progress in our faith. We would make progress in our walk with Him. Not standing still, not growing stagnant, not sleeping, not getting stuck, not rebellious. We are to be, as Paul says, pressing on, going forward, making progress in our faith. That's what God calls us to. And so I want to ask you this morning, are you growing in your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know God in increasingly new and fresh ways? As we sang that song this morning that Jesus is better, better than riches, better than life, better than all this world has to offer, do you know that to be true in increasingly new ways? Do you find yourself regularly astonished as you read His Word? Do you find your affections kindled so that you thirst for him more and more like the deer that pants for the water? Is your life governed progressively more by God's word? Do you grieve more over your sin now than you did a few years ago? How has your love for God's people grown and changed over the years? Are you making progress in the Christian life? Or have you grown complacent or stagnant? Well, this morning, I want to draw your attention to the example of the Apostle Paul to observe what maturity in the faith looks like so that we might benefit from him and emulate his pattern of faith so that we might grow to know God in increasingly new ways. Examples in the Christian life are important. Hebrews 13, 7 calls us to look at our leaders, to remember them, to consider their way of life and to imitate their faith. Well, this morning, we look to the example of the Apostle Paul. What we learn is that the one who God rewards is the one who runs hard until the end. So three observations from our text this morning. The first is that God rewards those who recognize their need for growth. Verse 12 says, Paul says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his. Now, remember where Paul is coming from here. Remember what he's just been talking about, what we heard the last couple of weeks as Bart preached, as John preached, uh, from these preceding verses. What he's been talking about are all these aspects of his life, 
all these ways that, um, that he is counted on to gain acceptance before God. So all this standing that he had in the community, all these spiritual aspects that he had achieved and that he was, that he was boasting in. But no longer was Paul counting on these things. No longer was he focused on an external righteousness. He recognized the futility of that. No longer did he look to the works that he was doing on himself, but rather look with me at verse 9 where he says, to be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This righteousness, this is what Paul is after. No longer the righteousness that he can gain on his own, but the righteousness that comes from God that is imputed to us, that that is given to us, that is credited to us. Even as Everett referenced earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.18, that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness that we enjoy, the standing that we have before God, the reason we can pray, the the reason we can gather and lift our hands in worship expecting the Lord's favor upon us is because we bear the righteousness of another. And that's what Paul was exulting in. That was what Paul delighted in. That was what Paul was after. Not a faith, not a righteousness according to works. And so that compelled Paul to want to know him more. That compelled him, as it says in verse 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, that I might become like him. And in verse 12, He wants to press on. Now think about this fact that the Apostle Paul, this man who has now walked with the Lord for 25, 30 years, who has accomplished so much for the sake of the gospel, think about the achievements that Paul had had accomplished at this point. He had planted churches. He had multiplied disciples everywhere he went. He wrote scripture. (laughs) He had grown in his knowledge to the point where God used him mightily to speak to you and I today. And this man, this same man, didn't consider that he had yet arrived. He wanted to press on. He recognized his need for growth. He knew that God wasn't finished with him. He knew he hadn't completed his race. He had not yet been made perfect. He still had a ways to go, just like you and I do this morning. Paul recognized his need for growth. And so he presses on. He wants to know Jesus better and better. Now, I don't know about you, but that massively encourages me because I stand here this morning with, without the list of accomplishments that Paul had. I don't have the standing that he did. In fact, I can be discouraged by how far I have to go simply when I look around this room and I see many of you who I see is further in the faith than I am. I look around this room and I wonder if I'm, at times, if I'm the only one who struggles this way and that. I can look around the room and, and see others and I think that they've got it all figured out. And they probably live a flawless life. What is wrong with me that I still have so far to go? But Paul, the Apostle Paul, did not want to leave us with the impression that he was flawless. Paul did not want to leave us with the impression that he had it all figured out at this point, that he had no room to grow. And this should inform the way that you and I live as well. We, like Paul, have room for growth. We should live always aware that we have not yet arrived, that there is still a race to finish, that there is still plenty of miles to run. So if you're here this morning painfully aware that you're not perfect. If you were here this morning as we sing songs wondering if these things are true, wondering, are these things true in my heart? Are these things true about me? Does God look at me and like the fact that I'm singing this morning? Are you aware that you're not perfect yet? Will you fit in well with all the rest of us? Because we're all broken this morning. We're all in need of help and hope. We're all in need of change. There are specific areas in my life that I need to make progress in every day that I'm reminded that I have a long way to go. If you want examples, just grab Holly after the service. My children are very aware that I'm not perfect. There are specific areas that I need to make war in. Now, I've been radically changed by the grace of God, and I'm growing, but I still have a ways to go, and I need to press on. I am not yet what I one day hope to be, and so I press on. I'm helped by Pastor Ray Ortland, who says, we're all weak, but we don't have to be supermen. 
God simply calls us to believe what we believe and to set our hearts on things above. If we will, that longing for God, that is the channel through which His power will lift us and renew us and and cheer us all the way there. Do you long for God like this this morning? Aware of your need for growth, aware of how far He's brought you, aware of the fact that Christ has made you His own, do you long for God like this? One of the ways that we benefit, as, as I enumerated some of the means of grace that God provided earlier, is the, is the means of examples. We have the example of lots of leavers throughout Scripture that helpfully compel us. As you read Paul, you should be provoked, you should be challenged, you should be instigated to run harder and faster. We also have the gift of a church, the gift of a community of believers, brothers and sisters who run the race alongside us and out in front of us that can compel us as well. So we should get some examples in our lives and follow them. Find people whose lives compel you to run harder and faster. Let me tell you about one of the examples in my life. Ricky Ramos is a man that I want to be like. I meet with this man once a month, usually over tacos, and I listen to him talk about areas in his life that he is seeking to grow in. We gather together, and he just humbly opens up his life. And this is a man who has walked for decades with the Lord. He's a man who has pastored a church for 20 years. And he's a man who I look up to and and see as, as so much further, but Ricky is not satisfied. Ricky is not content. Ricky is not saying, okay, I've I've done it, now I can coast. So Ricky continues to give himself to the study of Scripture. Every time I talk to him, he's talking about some significant Bible memory project that he's giving to. He is giving attention to areas of sin in his life that he wants to kill. Ricky is a man who isn't content with how far he's come, and he's striving to grow. He's striving to be a better husband and a better father and grandfather. He's striving to grow in his faith in God. Another man, Dean Prater, is another man I want to be like. One of the most humble men I know. Josh and Kirsten Tong are a couple who have shown me time and again what it is like. They've modeled for me faith in the midst of adversity. Mike Stellick is a man who has cultivated a life of prayer, who knows God as a loving father who delights to give good gifts to his children. Joe and Shoshana Friedman have a passion for sharing the gospel with the lost in a way that provokes me, and so I want to spend time around them because I want to be like them. Who are those people and your life, who compel you to run harder and faster? Who are those people that, that when you're around them, you just feel like you could storm the gates of hell? Who are those people that, want to, that you leave your time with them, and you want to go home and just devour the Scriptures to know God more like they know God? Who are those people? Find them and get around them. Spend time with them to the degree that their lives look and smell like Jesus emulate their example. Be humble and just, and just ask them those questions. Hey, tell me, about, tell me about your devotional time. Tell me about how do you lead your family? How do you grow in your faith? What does that look like in your life? God rewards those who recognize their need for growth. Secondly, God rewards those who passionately pursue Him. In verses 13 and 14, Paul calls us to one thing. He says he does one thing, and then like any good preacher, he lists like several things, right? We look at this. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul recognized that he would not get the prize. He wouldn't receive the reward if he didn't passionately pursue Jesus Christ. If he didn't press on and finish the race. Paul devoted his whole life to this one passionate pursuit, attaining the fullest possible experience of Christ imaginable. He wanted more. He had tasted so much, but he wasn't satisfied. He wasn't content. He had a holy discontentment. He was wholly passionate. Paul was an accomplished Christian, but that didn't, he didn't allow that to lead him to stagnation. Having achieved much in the Christian life, you and I, as far as we've walked, as much as we've achieved, however much we've achieved should never lead us to become complacent in our faith about where we currently stand, but it should compel us to run further. The more we taste, the more we should desire. Paul's language here is that of spiritual longing, thirsting, hungering. 
He was hungry for God. He was passionately pursuing the reward of knowing Christ and the power of His resurrection. And he was running all out. He wasn't trotting. He wasn't jogging. He was giving all that he had, refusing to give in to distraction, focused intently on the finish line. So Paul forgets what lies behind. He's not standing on his past accomplishments. He's not thinking, hey, I can take it easy. I don't need to run so hard. He doesn't want to grow complacent. Scholar and commentator P.T. O'Brien says he, he will not allow, Paul will not allow either the achievements of the past, which God has wrought, or for that matter, or for that matter his failures as a Christian to prevent his gaze from being fixed firmly on the finish line. In this, sight, in this sense, Paul forgets as he runs. Do you forget as you run, or do you, do you get distracted by your achievements? Do you get distracted by your failures? Do you allow these things to distract you from how hard we're called to run? Famous runner, Eric Liddell, who was an Olympic runner who ran back in the 1920s and was featured in the movie Chariots of Fire, which I, I commend to you as a wonderful, encouraging movie. In July 1923, Eric Liddell ran in a 400-meter race. This race is known as one of the most miraculous comebacks in track history. Around the first bend... He tripped over the legs of the English runner, J.J. Gillies, falling off the track. He fell down while the, runners kept, while the other runners kept running on. By the time he got back to his feet, the last of the other runners was 30 yards away. Imagine that, 30 yards away. Imagine getting up and seeing how far you failed, how far you have to go, and just being discouraged from even trying. But Eric stood up got back on his feet, and he attacked the other runners with such a pace that he finally overtook Gillies three yards from the line to win the race before collapsing spent, completely spent on the ground. After the race, Liddell was asked what his secret was. How could he possibly get up and run the race and win the prize against such insurmountable odds, against such glaring failure at the, at the outset? And he said, I ran the first 200 meters as hard as I can, and then for the second 200 meters, with God's help, I ran harder. He wasn't content with running as hard as he could. He continued to press on and to give himself to even harder and harder running. Paul was passionately pursuing one thing, knowing Christ Jesus and the power of his resurrection. He was intently focused on winning. He was intently focused on gaining the prize. Receiving the reward. So let me ask you this morning, what, what is it that you are passionately pursuing? What is your one thing that you're after in life? What is that one thing that you are so passionate about? For Paul, it was, it was to know Christ Jesus. He said, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Jesus meant everything. To Paul, what is it for you? Paul lived with a holy dissatisfaction about his spiritual life, and so must we, to recognize with Paul that we have not arrived, and to go further and to place at the pinnacle of our affections the reward of Christ Jesus, to know him more. Paul was dissatisfied about his spiritual life, but Paul wasn't discouraged. There's a difference between the two, dissatisfaction and discouragement. Being discouraged is usually rooted in pride, thinking that we're better than this or better than that. None of us should read this passage and come away discouraged. We shouldn't leave here walking in, in condemnation or frustration. But we should all, with Paul, cultivate a holy dissatisfaction about where we're at. We should be dissatisfied. We should hunger for more. We should long to press on to run all the harder by God's grace. We should all leave here today with renewed convictions, compelled to press on all the more because there is more joy to be had. There's more treasure ahead. 
to forget what we've already achieved, to forget the past, whether it's achievements, whether it's failures, to put them behind us and to press on. That's the call of God upon us today. We are not called to make camp and to stay put. We're not called to take it easy and to, and to go to sleep. We're not called to stand still. We're called to forget what lies behind and to strain ahead, to run all out, to give it all we've got, to make it our passion to gain Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters, it's worth the effort. God calls us to put all of our energy into making it to the end. Not dwelling on the life that we had before we started the race. Not revisiting past spiritual victories. But forgetting what lies behind and moving on, pressing on. Here's the point. Paul wants, Paul wants us to forget anything that might rob you or distract you from your pursuit of Christ. Anything that hinders you from growing in your face, whether it's failures, whether it's achievements, forget it, put it behind, and press on. Like Eric Liddell, he got up, just, just forget it. Okay, you're behind. Forget it. Get up and run. That's what we're called to, to press on. We can get distracted by our victories and we can get distracted by our failures. Have you ever noticed the failures in the Bible? Have you ever noticed that the people that God uses in the Bible all had shady pasts? He didn't save and use the impressive people of the world. He didn't save and use the strong and the pretty. He used the outcasts. He used those who weren't impressive in the side of the world. He used those who knew failure. Think about Hebrews 11 and who you read about in there. Think about Moses and how he struggled with anger and he struck the rock. And you know, Think about that man. Think about David and his failure. Think about Samson and the things that led him astray. Think about Rahab. Remember Rahab? She was a prostitute. And yet, given her dark past, given her failure, she is listed in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith as one of the women of whom the world is not worthy because she pressed on despite her failure and gave herself to God. Our spiritual victories, friends, are never so great that we're beyond our need for God. And our spiritual failures, our weaknesses are never so significant, never so bad that he can't redeem us and take us on to greater heights. So press on. That's what we're called to this morning is to forget whatever it is that's distracting you. This is where we must not rest satisfied with where we are and stop running hard. We want to run hard until the end. We want to, we want to run hard so that at the end, like Eric Liddell, we just collapse and fall over, out of breath. We've given it our all. When we're dissatisfied, when we have that holy dissatisfaction that Paul had, we move on for more, we put forth more effort, and we work hard to taste more. We forget what lies behind it, and we strain ahead. We give it our all. Listen to Jonathan Edwards talking about holy dissatisfaction. He said, spiritual good is of a satisfying nature. And for that very reason, the soul tastes and knows its nature, will thirst after it and a fullness of it that it may be satisfied. And the more he experiences and the more he knows this excellent unparalleled, exquisite, and satisfying sweetness, the more earnestly he will hunger and thirst for more. So he doesn't taste and say, okay, that's good, I'm, I'm satisfied. No, he wants more. He wants more. So this week, what is one way that you can make progress in the faith? What is one way this week that you can grow to be more like Jesus Christ? What is one way that you can know him better and more this week? One way to apply, one way that you can strain forward this week. Don't leave here with two or three or seven or eight or 15 different ways like I do at times. I can just jot down, oh, here's a way and here's a way and here's a way that I fall short and here's another way. And don't go here overwhelmed with all kinds of ways that you can apply this and grow. Leave here today with one way, one specific area that you can apply and make progress in. 
And don't underestimate them. I mean, for all you spiritual superheroes out there that can make progress in like seven or eight ways at a time, you think, one way, that's not enough. I want eight ways to grow. Man who just went to be with the Lord, David Pallison, my favorite writers and, and biblical counselors, said that change in one area of your life will affect every other area of your life. That's significant. If you grow in one area in your life, it will affect other areas. It will affect your relationships. It will affect your countenance before the Lord. It will affect the way you approach the Bible. It will affect the way you walk into work. Change in one area will affect every other area of your life. So what's one way this week that you can apply this text, that you can press on? One way to strain for it. As you focus on your one thing this week, do so anticipating that God is faithful to his word. When God says in Philippians 1, 6, that he will complete the work that he's begun in you, anticipate that this week he's completing that work. This week he's going to meet you. This week he's going to help you. This week he will help you make progress in the faith. This week you should expect him to help you grow and change as you give yourself to passionately pursuing him. And, and just, a, just a pro tip here. If you're trying to grow in patience, anticipate that the traffic is, is going to be extra hard this week. If you're trying to grow in forbearance and forgiveness, anticipate conflicts to come. And see those as opportunities to strain forward in that way. Anticipate those as opportunities to grow in the faith. And finally, God rewards those who hold true to the gospel. Here, Paul addresses those who are mature. And in so doing, he's not simply writing to the mature. He may be using a bit of irony here in speaking to those who think that they're mature. To those who are mature, to those who think they're mature, to those who are immature, he speaks the same word to us all, to hold true to what we've attained. He's calling us to stand fast. He is calling us to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. So what is it that we've attained? Look back at verse 12. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already per made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. That's what we have atta attained. We have attained the gospel. We've received from him righteousness outside of us. By faith, we've been grafted into the body of Christ. We've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We have entered into the kingdom of God and we are seated in the heavenly places. We have that, brothers and sisters. We have that to look forward to and to enjoy now and in the future in increasing and in progressive ways. We do not yet see perfectly. We are not yet what we will one day be, but we hold fast to what is true. We must never neglect the gospel. We need to hold it true. This is the mindset that we're to adopt. We've been saved by grace. We will continue by grace. It is by the grace of God that we are who we are, but we have to contend for that. We have to hold on to that because the world calls to us in all kinds of ways. The world challenges us. The world, our culture, puts us to the side where we feel increasingly marginalized and we're tempted to compromise our faith. And so we must hold true to the gospel. John Newton held true to the gospel until the end. John Newton was a man who knew failure. John Newton was a man who knew what it was to anticipate the wrath of God. As a slave trader, uh, he knew the, a dark past, but he was saved. He was reconciled to God, and this man later on became a pastor. He pastored for 40 years, and writing near the end of his life, having served as a pastor for over 40 years, written thousands of letters and pages that make up books now, Listen to what this man said at the end of his life. He said, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Is that true for you this morning? Do you hold on to that? As great as our sin is, Christ is greater as great as our achievements are, Christ is better. 
That we hold on to true. That should be precious to us every morning. That when we want to get our souls happy in the Lord in the morning, we should remember that true. Rehearse those truths. Go back to Psalm 103 and think about what God has done with your sin. Not just your sin in the past, but the sins just this morning, the sins yesterday. He has put them into the sea. And rejoice that you are His. Rejoice that you have been made His own and hold true to that. We've been saved, friends, by the power of the gospel. And as we grow in Christian maturity, we must never move on from the gospel. We don't move on to bigger and better things. John Newton could have moved on to bigger and better things. Paul could have moved on to bigger and better things. But they knew that the best thing was the gospel. That is what was true. So hold on to that. We must grow in our understanding of the gospel. We grow in our ability to articulate the implications of the gospel. But we never move on from the gospel. We must never lose our grip there. For the gospel, the gospel, as Romans 1 says, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is what Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 15, is that of what was of most importance. And it's the gospel that Paul admonishes us to stand, by which we are being saved if we hold fast to it. So we must hold fast. Hold true to the gospel that we've attained. We must never be satisfied with yesterday's grace, but to press on for more. We must never be content with yesterday's triumph, but rather every day say, God, give me new mercies today. Give me more grace today. There's a, listen, there's a right reason and a wrong reason to press on. We don't press on so that God will accept us. We don't press on to gain acceptance by God, but we press on because of our acceptance by God, because He has already accepted us. That, that is a crucial distinction. See, we can often, you know, we've talked a little bit about you know, the danger of legalism these past, last few weeks, that we can subtly seek to smuggle in our works. We think that our standing before God is better on days that we read our Bible more and pray more and on days that we share the gospel or, or don't sin quite as much. We can smuggle that in. That's not where we get our our standing before God. We get it because Christ Jesus has made us his own. We get it because we have a righteousness that is alien to us. And so having that, having received from Christ, having been embraced from him and rescued by him, Paul calls us now to hold true and to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. In other words, don't forget who you are. We don't want to lose that sense of awe and wonder at what God has done in your life. Do you still marvel at the fact that he saved you? Does that still cause you to to sit still and question, why would he save me? Has he saved me? Do, do Do you question at times, surely, if he's aware of all that I've done, Would he call me his child upon upon whom he delights and places his affections? That should cause us to marvel. Are you still moved to tears when you consider how patient he has been toward you? Are you still astonished as you consider the fact that he has saved you? Because it is astonishing that he has saved us. It is worthy of marveling at. We shouldn't take that for granted. We're not we're not just good people that well, it kind of makes sense that he's saving. Do you ever look at people that way? I mean it makes sense that they become a Christian. It's not the case for people throughout the Bible. That's not the case for me. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for you either. We should be astonished. So we must be careful to hold true to this, to never lose that sense of awe and wonder. In the face of cultural opposition, our own internal struggles and temptations, we're always prone to a hardening of our hearts or of simply loving this present world and conforming our lives to the culture around us and lose the love that we had at first. And this is where Paul calls us to hold true, to hold fast, to follow his example and run the race until the end so that we can win the prize. So friends, this morning, if you you find yourself not regularly moved in your affections for God, I want to encourage you to to go back to the gospel. I want to encourage you to consider 
how it is that you became a Christian? How is it that the gravity of your situation placed you before him to receive him by faith? Read the scriptures and meditate on his grace. Go back through this letter of Paul and ask God to show you his glory. Read Psalm 103. Read Psalm 51 and ask God to kindle your affections. Pray for God to give you a heart that melts as you see his beauty, that hungers and thirsts for the righteousness of him. Read books. Read books that provoke your affections. Don't simply read books that that grow you in knowledge. It's good to grow in knowledge. It's good to think. It's good to love our God with all our mind, but it's good to read books that provoke our affections. So which books are those for you? Which writers are are they that when you read them, when you read them, you're provoked? Who is it that you read and you just want to put down the book and start singing songs praising God? For me, that's John Newton. Jerry Bridges, John Piper, C.J. Mahaney, these people get the gospel. They knew what it is to be saved by grace. A couple of them still do. A couple of them are dead. A couple of them are still alive. Get, get old dead ones, old books that have stood the test of time. Get some, some people now who kindle your affections for the Lord and give yourself to reading those books. We hold on, brothers and sisters, to what we've attained in Christ. We celebrate every day that he has laid hold of us because our lives are found in him. They are hidden in Christ on high. We belong to him. And he is working in us by the power of his spirit for the sake of his glory. And he will complete that work, shaping us and conforming us to his image. He won't stop until he's done. So celebrate that. Hold true to that and press in for more. Don't let yourself drift, but go hard. Don't play games, but toil and strive to know him better and better. And don't be discouraged when you, when you see how far you still have to go. Listen to John Piper speaking about this passage. He says that no one starts out as a mature Christian. We all have a ways to go. He says, keep seeking God, keep laboring to grow, and keep trusting that God will bring about our maturity. So hold true. Don't give up. Grow in your faith. Be aware that at no point do we get to the point where we don't need more grace. No point do we not need him. We all have friends. We all have examples that we've seen of people who ran a good race for a while and then came up short. We all know people who have run hard, who accomplished much, and then fell away. There's a difference between starting strong and finishing strong. It's possible to start the race and to fall and to give up and not complete it. That's a danger that we're all vulnerable to. So we want to press on because Jesus is better, because Jesus is worth. We want to press on knowing that he rewards those who seek. And we want to press on for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, to know him and the power of his resurrection. So we want to press on and not stop running until we cross the finish line, until we hit the tape. We want to run hard and go all out. We, as those who have been saved by Jesus should be the most joyful and confident and courageous people in all the world because we have been saved by the holy God of the universe. And if he is for us, then there is nothing and no one who can be against us, nothing that can hinder us. How amazing is that? Brothers and sisters, we must press on. We press on because we are saved, not by our striving, but by the love of another. We are saved. At the end of it, we are saved because of God's grace. We'll stand before him, not boasting in our strength, but we'll point to him and say it's because of his grace, because of his sacrifice that we stand. And so by God's grace, we press on for more, to know him more until our faith turns to sight. Friends, we will finish this race. We will receive the prize. We will get the crown of life, not because we are runners, not because we are great runners, but because Christ Jesus has made us his own. In that we hope, in that we rejoice, and in that now, let's pray.